mostly just here. All right, we know it is top of the hour, but let's give a minute for all of our attendees to get logged in and we'll hand this off to our presenters. All right, we have quite a few people on, so while the rest are logging in, let's go ahead and get started before I hand it over to the presenters. Just a reminder for you, this webinar is not for CPE credit. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A box located on your menu bar, or you can use the chat feature. Any question that needs immediate assistance, I'll go ahead and answer. Otherwise, all questions relating to the presentation, we will hang on and answer those at the end. So let's go ahead and turn this over now to Art and Scott and get started. Go ahead, guys. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Art Wiederman. Uh, I'm a CPA and a partner at HMWC. CPAs and business advisors in Tustin, California, beautiful today, sunny Cal Southern California. And um, this is our weekly uh, HMWC I Bailey uh, update on the PPP programs, and we'll tell you about what we're going to be talking about uh, uh, here in a second. But let me introduce my um, uh, my panel here. I've got uh, Scott Haberman, and we're very excited that Scott, uh, the last time we introduced him, he was a senior tax manager. He is now a tax partner at I Bailey. Congratulations on that, Scott. That's a huge accomplishment for you. Um, so Scott is going to be, uh, Scott's um, located in Fort Collins, Colorado, and he is, um, uh, his uh, CPA practice is specialized, as is mine, in working with, with dentists. Uh, Amy, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we have Randy Curry. Now, Randy has not been on uh, this series yet. Uh, Randy is a dear friend of mine. Randy is an attorney in Newport Beach, California. Uh, Randy and I, at, uh, in, at, towards the end, we're gonna be talking about a really important topic today, which is gonna be uh, how the use of a business interruption insurance policy uh, could come into play as part of all of this COVID-19 pandemic and your financial losses. So uh, do not go anywhere. This is really, really important information. Uh, we have Dan Bywater, who is the vice president at Ready Capital. Dan has been with us on each of our uh, webinars, our, our Tuesday webinars and has been instrumental in helping to keep us abreast of um, what's happening with the banks and he'll be chiming in. And then we have uh, Megan Mortimer. Megan is uh, the congressional lobbyist for the American Dental Association and has been an unbelievable resource uh, to all of us in the dental profession in helping to keep us uh, uh, in tune of what Treasury is doing and she's got some updates today. So let's, let's go to the next slide. And this is what we're gonna be talking about today, folks. Uh, we're gonna give you our updates on the PPP and EIDL. Um, as you're gonna find out shortly, unfortunately, the Small Business Administration has not provided us uh, with the exception of one frequently asked question, which we have a slide on, uh, any guidance on how the forgiveness of PPP loans work, but we're gonna get into some thoughts we have about this. Uh, what are your options without the guidance? What are your next steps? And we're going to give you choices and things to think about. Uh, tips on what to pay and when. Um, the IRS came out with a ruling, uh, 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 ruling uh, 2020 dash, notice 2020 dash 32, Scott, I think is what it was. Is that right? Yeah, 2020 dash 32, right. um, which talked about the deductibility, the deductibility of forgiven. PPP expenses for tax purposes. We have a whole set of slides and we'll let you know the update on that. And then we're gonna to talk to Randy about how your business interruption insurance policy works and how you, what, what 
actions you might consider taking uh, probably sooner rather than later. So uh, let's go right to our topic here. And uh, we've got a lot, I put a lot of slides together for today. So let's give you some updates. So on Monday, so remember folks, we have these two loan programs. We have the EIDL loan program, which is applied for through the SBA. And it includes a 10, 000, up to a $10,000 grant, which we've all learned is $1,000 per employee, and also includes loans of up to um, $2 million at 30-year amortization, 3.75% interest. So the IDLE program was inundated. Again, this IDLE program was intended for things like Hurricane Katrina and the California wildfires and things like that. Well, it just got absolutely inundated on March 16th when the United States economy started to shut down. Well, in the last round of funding, the SBA, uh, the Congress funded another $60 billion to this program. However, and you might have seen, uh, uh, you might have seen 60 Minutes last Sunday nights where they talked about uh, small farmers and agricultural groups not getting government aid and things like that. So on Monday, Megan, I believe they came out and said that idle applications will now only be accepted for certain agricultural and farm business due to the unprecedented demand. You, you, you heard that, obviously? Yeah, they're still processing the backlog of people who had applied before the funding ran out. So I don't want anyone to be nervous if they applied you know, a few weeks ago and were put on hold that they aren't being processed. But from now on, new applicants at least for the time being, will only be agricultural businesses. That, that's right. And, and, and it's, it says uh, it, it's on a first come, first serve basis. And uh, many of my clients, and Scott, you have to tell me if yours did too, many of our clients got letters from, their, from the SBA directly over the weekend um, that said, hey, guys, we're, we're processing this. Don't worry. Uh, there's been unprecedented demand and we're working on it. Did, did your clients get those too, Scott? Yeah, but the ones that had received the idle loan, even the advance or the grant, whatever you want to call it, um, they just received a random deposit into their bank account with no emails or not notifications or calls. So that's been a little <laughs> bit of a surprise um, as well that I think is catching mean, folks off mean, guard. You mean just for the grant money or for the whole loan amount? For the grant money. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll, you'll have to be signing. And, and by the way, folks, there's a slide on here in capital letters that says, if you get an IDLE loan or you get a PPP loan, be sure to read, read your loan documents. Very, very important. Um, the SBA has specific documentation requirements here. So uh, again, you know, you got the, the email over the weekend, they're working on it. Uh, the grants are $1,000 per employee up to a maximum of $10,000. Um, we are recommending folks that you use this money for things that you don't use PPP money for. Um, working capital, lab, supplies, um, professional fees, uh, business taxes. Uh, don't use this for the same things that you use PPP money. Um, and if you do get an EIDL loan, you cannot use it to refinance debt, uh, to make capital expenditures and, and things like that. Use it for working capital. So the, the theory is, if you've got a PPP loan, and we're going to get deep into that, you use that for eight weeks, okay? What do we do after eight weeks, which is a big concern of all of ours, if you get this EIDL loan, which could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, payable at 30 years, that's your cushion after you're done with PPP. That's your working capital as you begin to ramp up your dental practice, as our economy, knock wood, hopefully starts coming back. Um, and and that's, your, that's your safety net if you get that. So uh, if you get that, I would take it, there's no prepayment penalty, Scott. There's no prepayment penalty on this loan. If someone gets a quarter of a million dollar idle loan and they've got a PPP loan, I'm thinking we just, what do you think? We just take this money, we put it in the bank, uh, we yeah. don't have to make payments on it for a year. Yeah, I think I think you gotta you gotta take the capital when you have the chance right now, especially with the uncertainty of the market. Um, I think it's pretty important to secure that as well, Art. I agree. Absol absolutely. Um, so again, you cannot use 
your EIDL loan for expansions. I've had several clients, I don't know about you, Scott, I've had several clients who've said, I'm just gonna take my EIDL loan and, and pay off my, um, uh, my line of credit, or I'm gonna pay off my, my, I got an equipment loan at 7% and I'm gonna pay that off. And, and the answer is no, we can't do that. Bad things will happen to you Correct. if you do that. Yeah. Okay, so again, can't use it for expansion, refinancing, it is intended. You can use it if you have you know, business credit cards that you need to pay off. You can use it for that. So, all right. So updating, now we're going to get to PPP loans. All right. So over the weekend, SBA issued some statistics and they're on the SBA's website. By the way, I, on the Treasury's website, if you go to treasury.gov and Megan, you and I refresh this, what, about every five minutes? Right? Yeah, it's becoming obsessive. I have to it's say. Obsessive. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like, you know, so really you have to eat dinner. No, I have to, I have to, have to update this one more time. It's going to drive us crazy because that's where you're going to see all the added guidance. So over the weekend, they issued some statistics that said that if you remember about two weeks ago, when Congress passed the second $484 billion funding bill, of which $310 billion was added to the payroll protection program, of that, $175 billion was, um, has been spoken for, if you will, out of that 310. Now, I think that some of that is because there's been such a backlog and there's been slow processing. Dan, let me ask you a question. Has the processing of these loans sped up a little bit now that the second round is in? How's that working out? Um. That's a kind of a mixed bag. It kind of depends on what, what kind of entity the application's under. Um, a lot of independent contractors and sole props were hit pretty hard when the SBA came out with additional guidance on how to calculate these loans. We've actually had to go back to thousands and thousands of applications and ask for information we didn't think we would need when the, the initial rules were set out. Um, for instance, uh, in fact, I'm looking at an a, a independent contractor, Dennis, um, and uh, he sent in 1099s and everything he thought he would need in the beginning, but the SBA came out and said, well, actually, we need Schedule Cs, um, 2019, um, so to speak. So um, it can be a draft form. It doesn't have to be a submitted 2019, but it can be draft. So we've had to request that from thousands of uh, sole props and independent contractors. So that's really slowed up those applications because of that rule change. Well, and, and again, th this is again the, the, the theater of the absurd on, on April 24th, they came out with the rules of how you apply for these loans when 90% of the people had already applied for these loans. And that's where some of that, that guidance came in. Now, Dan, if someone has not applied, there's $145 billion left. I mean, I've been reading things that, uh, you know, this money will run out. M Megan, any estimates from anybody you're talking to is how much longer we got to if anybody hasn't applied yet? Um, we were told that, I mean, they're still processing a backlog. So we were told no more than a week. So, right. um, so I think this is only the stuff that's, this is only the stuff that's been, um, you know, allocated for, but I think that they're still processing a backlog of applications in a number of, of places. And okay. the smaller lenders sometimes have more difficulty in processing those and they're the ones being um, given the extra lift right now. So. I don't think that there's much left is what I'm. Right. And, and then, and then in, in CARES 2.0, has there been any talk yet about a third funding for this program or is it too soon? Uh, there is talk about funding more for both IDLE and PPP. Um, however, it's less of a bipartisan push than it has been the previous two times. So it's gonna be a bigger lift to get additional funding for these programs moving forward. And I don't think Congress is back for a while or, or are they coming back? Well, the Senate's back this week, um, but have, the House isn't coming back until next week. So um, again, nothing can be done congressionally until next week in terms of anything being completed. And we're not, we're being given estimates of at least a couple more weeks before we see any sort of bipartisan draft legislation. Okay. So again, the average, the good news is that the average loan in the first round, whereas we heard all this uh, about Ruth Chris Steakhouse, the Los Angeles Lakers getting all this money, it was like 750 billion to, million to a billion dollars, which was given back. The average loan in the first round was over 200,000. In this round, it was about 80,000. 
which means that theoretically smaller businesses are getting more of this money. And that's the idea is that's what they want. In fact, last week they set aside a day where banks with 1 billion in assets, which a billion sounds like a lot of money, Dan, but for a bank, that's not a big bank, right? Yeah, not at all. It, uh, it's not very big at all. Right. So, so they set aside that only those banks for that one day, I think it was, could apply. But again, you should apply sooner rather than later if you have not applied and you do choose that you want to apply. Uh, check with the bank. Dan, are, are you, is your company taking applications anymore or are you still done? We, we haven't advertised it. So this is kind of like an I Bailey, like, like uh, a special deal, huh? one time special deal. Like if you go to our website, we'll, we'll take those applications. Um, I can't promise we'll get you the funds, but we, we are taking some applications. If they want to, I'm probably opening flood, floodgates here, but if they want to reach out to me personally through my email address, I'll do my best to get them up front and, and get these funded. Well, Dan, I can tell you that Dan has helped several of my clients who couldn't get through with their bank. So thank you for your, all your help. Let's go to the next slide, Amy. Okay, so now we're going to talk strategy. What you, you, many of you have gotten your money as early as April 15th to April 17th. Here's our problem. And this is where Megan and I are tearing our hair out. Megan was talking about maybe even setting her hair on fire all over this. I don't know what we're going to do. It is so frustrating. I can't even begin to tell you. Megan, how many thousands of questions have you fielded about the PPP program that your answer is, we just have to wait for the guidance from the SBA, right? So many. And I hate giving that answer, but it, it is what it is. It's horrible. Uh, the SBA has given us one piece of forgiveness information, which we have a slide on, which we'll share with you a little later. So some of you are two to three weeks into this eight-week period. So at the moment, your eight-week period, that if you want forgiveness on this loan, this eight-week period starts the day that the money goes into your account. And some of you have gotten this money April 15th, April 17th. So you might be three weeks into this, and you're thinking, what do I do? So I will tell you that the American Dental Association and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and I'm sure there are other groups too, are strongly advocating for business owners to be allowed now. It, it, it used to be when they chose, but now, Megan, I think that, that the push on Congress is let them pick the date they, that the governor of their state allows PPP borrowers to go back to work. Is that, is that what the, the push is now? Yeah, that's our, that's our new narrative. Okay, and, and, and you know, any feel for anything that this might change or is it too late? No, I, I don't, I, my problem is, and I think that a lot of the questions that people would have is for people who've already received it, who have started following the rules and started bringing right. back people on payroll. How would we deal with that swath of people who are doing that already? Would we do something retroactively to benefit them? How would that work? Um, there is bipartisan support for this, very much so, because there's a lot of congressional members from states who are not going to be opening up for a little while and are hearing a lot from their constituents about that. So again, I, I know there's bipartisan support, um, but I don't want anyone to rely on that happening. No, absolutely not. And, and I, did, I don't know if I mentioned this before, we have five of our representatives in Congress who are actually dentists, right? Yes, we have five dentist members of Congress and they have I'm been sure great champions. I'm sure you all know, you know them all very well. So there you go. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the states are opening. Oregon opened on May first. Um, I was looking for the date Nevada opened. I don't know. Do you have clients, Scott, in Nevada? Um, I don't know. I know Nevada was either very close or is already opening. In fact, I'm supposed to do a, a this webinar for all the dentists in the state of Nevada, and they said hold off. We might have to do it in the evening because people are going back to work. Mm -hmm. I know Nevada. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard on their open date. Colorado, we opened last week. Um, and I, I did hear that about Oregon too. Opening. Okay. So now we have many of our, many of the people on this call are from California. They're our clients. And again, I wanted to do a shout out to my, yeah. to my here's their friends and partners, Pam Chamberlain, Don Watson, Sam William. Uh, we are answering PPP EIDL questions um, every day, all day, emails, calls, texts. It, it's crazy. So I want to shout out to the three of them that they are just doing an amazing job on our, helping our clients through this. I'm doing 
uh, of some of the PPP consulting, <laughs> I'm sure Scott is too. Um, so for many of our California clients, I'm gonna take a second, just kind of let you know where we're at. And if you'd go to the next slide, please, Amy. This is on the California Dental Association's website. And it basically says that, I mean, you, the California dentists and, uh, are not working because of a California Department of Public Health order. And uh, they're awaiting specific guidance from CDPH, uh, which is expected to be released shortly. Uh, I actually had it in the slide, but I took it out. I believe you will hear from, from my sources, you will hear something California dentists, hopefully this week. We're hoping that the Department of Public Health is gonna, we're gonna hear something this week. Um, in the meantime, dentists should continue to be available for dental care on urgent, um, urgent care. And uh, Megan, let me jump off just for, as a side note. I know ADA, I know Mike Graham was emailing us that ADA is doing everything they can to try and get PPE equipment to dentists around the country. W w how is that working? Is that, are you guys having any success? We are. So we got great news yesterday that FEMA is going to be putting uh, the dental profession higher up in the queue for those who should be receiving PPE before others. Um, I can't report yet on what number it is, but it's very positive and it's definitely a, a step in the right direction for ensuring that people are aware that dental practices specifically are more vulnerable to COVID and therefore should be one of the first providers in line for PPE. Um, we are also then working very hard on the private sector front as well with our distributors to make sure that they don't forget about us and that they don't overlook us um, in favor of other larger medical or um, hospital groups that can afford to buy in, in larger bulk. So we're really trying to look out for our small dental practices to make sure they get access to PPE, whether it be through federal and state means or through the private sector. And, and, and I know, I think it was, I want to say Honeywell, got the city of Los Angeles uh, or the state of California like $24 million, 24 million uh, 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 N95 masks. I heard something about that. I mean, everybody is trying to get everything that they possibly can because they know how urgent this is. I mean, we could have all the PPP money in the world, but if our departments of public health come out, Megan, and say, this is how you have to practice um, and you don't have this gear, it doesn't matter how much money you have, right? Right. And we, we want the federal and state health, you know, whether it be CDC or others, to make sure they're following the science, right? And to ensure that whatever decisions they make are based on sound science and not just necessarily an overreaction. Okay, great. Let's go to the next slide. So folks, let's get into what's the advice now? Okay, we as advisors, you know, it would be like you as a dentist trying to give advice to a patient. Do you need a crown? Do you need a um, you know, uh, 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 you know, a three surface composite, you need an inlay, you need an onlay, uh, but you never went to dental school and nobody told you what the rules were to do on all these things. That's what this is like, right, Megan? I mean, it, it, it's, it's crazy. So let's go back to the intent. Anytime that you look at a law, uh, Scott, you know, you and I have been in the tax business a long time. We know we have the internal revenue code. We have regulations. The regulations interpret the internal revenue code, but they always go to what the code says. Our code in this PPP situation is the CARES Act, which was signed on the 27th of March. So let's go back to basics. The intent of Congress was for business owners to get this money, to put everybody back on payroll as soon as possible, and to get the furlough uh, and laid off workers back to work and off of unemployment. Megan, I don't think that's an inaccurate statement at all, right? That's what they want you to do. Okay. Exactly. Now, on April 8th, the SBA came out and said the eight week in, in congruence with this, the SBA came out and said, you know what? Um, we don't want you holding on to this money until your office opens. That's not what we want. Because, and again, I am not advocating. I am, I'm just explaining. Again, please don't shoot the messenger, folks. So what, what, the, what the government doesn't want is they don't want to pay for unemployment for seven weeks. And then you put people back, you open your office, and then they have eight weeks, they're paying for your employees for 15 weeks. What their intent was, what their intent was, was that you get them off of unemployment the day you get this money, you pay them for eight weeks, and after eight weeks, well, we'll see what happens. That's kind of what the thought process was, wasn't it, guys? I mean, that, that's what it was. So, you know, you're, you're saying, well, it's not fair. It's not fair, my office isn't open. You know, and again, I'm not defending the United States government. I'm just 
giving information. This is what they want you to do. It's their money they're giving it to you, right, wrong, or otherwise. So, you know, dentists and other business owners that we talked about, you know, they, they don't want to pay employees if, if their businesses are closed. We understand that. Now, many employees, to be real blunt with you folks, and, uh, you know, next week we are going to have a labor law attorney, Ali Ramshian, on this, and we're going to talk about this um, on this, on this uh, webinar next uh, Tuesday. Many employees of dentists, they're, they're making more money on unemployment than they would be if they were working, and I've talked to lots of people about that, and that is a big deal, and we're not getting into labor laws today. That is just a mathematical fact. And the CARES Act, if you go back, go back to the law, it states that borrowers will use the proceeds of this loan to retain, this is right in the CARES Act, I printed it right off of there, um, retain workers and maintain payroll. I mean, Scott, is that kind of the message you're giving to your clients is this is what they want you to do. They don't want you to wait. They want you to get the money and they want you to put people back on payroll. Yeah, yeah, and like you, Art, and your team, I've been having those what-if conversations and hypotheticals, but we always go back to what's the intent? If we don't have any guidance here in this question, what's the intent of the law? <laughs> And so, and that's what we always go back to. And that's what we have to wait on for future guidance is, okay, well, we have these questions, but we don't have that guidance yet, but here's the intent of the law. Exactly. Next slide, please, Amy. Okay, so let's go back to the, to, to the basic rules. In order for you to get maximum forgiveness, if that is what your objective is, on this PPP loan, you must do two things. You must spend at least 75% of the loan proceeds on payroll costs, which include all the payroll you pay to your employees, and that includes all the non-taxable benefits like uh, flexible spending account, cafeteria plan, anything that, that goes into their pay, whether they pay tax on it or, or not. State unemployment taxes, not federal, not federal employer taxes, health insurance for your employees, and retirement plan costs. And they want you to have the same number of full-time employees on June 30th or when your eight-week period expires, whichever is sooner, than you had. And there's two different sets of dates. I'm not getting into all that right now. So those are the big rules. 75% for payroll. Megan, we were talking before, they can spend 25% of this money on rent, utilities, and interest on loans. Now, interest on loans I want to bring up again I've had people say, can I pay off my credit card interest? Can I pay off my lines of credit? The CARES Act specifically states that it, it says in the code, mortgage interest on per, mortgage, mortgage loans on personal and real property. Well, a credit card is not mortgage on personal and real property. An unsecured line of credit is not mortgage interest on personal and real property. So I don't think that your interest on your credit card loans or your lines of credit, or a loan from mom and dad is going to cut it. But again, Megan, we need guidance. We don't know. Let's go to the next slide, Amy. So to receive forgiveness, you have to do these things. So if I say to you guys to do anything other than what the government intends you to do without their guidance, I, I think I'm opening up, for, opening up Pandora's box. If I say, you know what, don't worry about it. The government wants you to be okay. The government wants you to do this. Just hang on to this money. Don't start paying your employees till your office opens. Uh, don't pay them all. Bring That is not what this is intended for. The, 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 Scott, I guess we'll say the company line is, you know, if you get this money and you want to follow the rules and you don't want to have any problems down the road when this guidance comes out, you basically need to put these people back on payroll where they were before the COVID-19 pandemic came out. Does anybody have a problem with that statement? I mean, that's, that's what they want you to do. The law. Yep. I mean, follow the law. Okay. So that's, that's what we're saying. Um, I mean, I've had clients who've said, Art, I don't care what the law says. I need this for working capital. This is my only safety net. I don't have an idle loan. I don't have any savings. I don't have any lines of credit. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I need this money to survive. And if that's the choice you make, that's on you guys. It's not on us. You know, we're telling people the advice has been from the beginning. 
go ahead, get this money, put your people back on payroll, <laughs> get into your offices, start doing what you need to do to get ready. I mean, in California, folks, we could be looking at two, three, four weeks here. You know, I don't know uh, when they're going to let you back. Some of you are already back in your offices and you need to get going. Uh, here's another important thing. Read your promissory note. And this is interesting. I'm not going to mention the name of the bank, but one of the major banks has a provision. I'm not picking on them. This is just a fact. In the promissory note that says you must apply for loan forgiveness within 90 days of the date you receive the funds. Uh, Megan and Scott, I don't think that's in the CARES Act, unless I'm wrong. I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, the CARES. I think the right. timing that's in there, I believe, and I might be misspeaking, but I, I think the bank is supposed to get back to you within 60 days of that submitting your application yep. for the forgiveness verdict. That's the only timing that, I've seen. Yep. Right, but there's nothing in that says when you have to apply for the forgiveness. This bank's promissory note says 90 days. So you get to the eight week period, 56 days, you get back to life, you're real busy and you forgot. And, and Scott, you and I are probably not calling hundreds and hundreds of dentists and say, did you file for your forgiveness yet? I mean, we might end up having to do that and that might end up happening. Uh, in, in, in which case, you, you know, I'll just tell my, 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 my wife, nice seeing you, just send me, send me, a, send me some El Polio Loco or something and I'll eat every once in a while. But, but, but you, it's your responsibility, doctors, to file for forgiveness. And if you don't on this particular bank, within 34 days, because 56 and 34 is 90, uh, you're out of luck. You may not get your forgiveness. So look at my underlined on this slide, ladies and gentlemen. It is unclear at this moment what ramifications you would have if you choose to hold on to the money till your office opens, if you choose not to use the money in whole or in part during the eight-week period as it's intended by Congress and to keep it as working capital. We hope that the guidance is going to say, well, if we can only bring back two-thirds of our staff, pay two-thirds of your staff because it doesn't make business sense uh, or people have quit and we don't have as many team members, um, we hope the, that the guidance says that there's not going to be penal, you're not going to be penalized. We hope at the end of the day, if you calculated your PPP loan and you spent it, what you believe, all on payroll or most on payroll, the 75%, and maybe your rent is very, very low and you didn't, didn't spend 25%, can we give bonuses? Can we use this money after the period? These are all wonderful questions that we've all been getting for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we have to say, we don't know. Right now, if you, our best thought is if you put everybody back on payroll, when you get this money and you pay them for this eight week period, you will be following the CARES Act, you'll be following the law and you will have the maximum opportunity to get forgiveness if that is what your objective is. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So in the CARES Act, it specifically talks. So let's now talk about what does it say? It says an eligible recipient will be eligible for forgiveness on a covered loan in amount equal to the sum of the following, and, and this is bolded, costs incurred and payments. Scott, what accounting school did you go to? Uh, University of Washington. All right, go Huskies. So at the University of Washington, what do they teach you about what is incurred and payments made? What does that mean? Well, I don't mean to be, I'm not patronizing you. I'm just saying, let's explain <laughs> to these folks what this means. Well, it depends if you're a accrual or cash basis taxpayer, right, Art? Oh, don't be doing that to me. Stop that. <laughs> but I mean, incurred. Are, are cash, right? And so when you go back down to that language, costs incurred and payments made. So all the payments in, uh, incurred uh, for say payroll, well, you want to look back to, okay, when are the employees starting to work? And is that before or after the loan? Will that qualify? That's the question that we're getting a lot. And is there going to be any flexibility there? So say if you had payroll before you got the loan, but you're going to pay it out after you got the loan and it maybe straddles that date, um, is that going to be all qualified for PPP use or not? So Yeah, and, and I got a call yesterday. Doctor calls me up, Scott, and says, and Megan says, hey, Art, great news. I got my PPP loan, $120,000. Great, let's talk about it. He says, yeah, I got a payroll that I'm going to call in for today, May, which was yesterday, May 4th, and it goes from April 20th to May 4th. I'm calling in today. What do you think? I said, no, don't do that. Because let's think about it this way. 
So the, and remember folks, this is the most, and this might be the most important thing we say to you in this entire series. The end game is going to be a bank underwriter. And Dan, maybe you chime in on this. At the end of the day, you're gonna submit a package to a bank underwriter. That underwriter has not lived this nightmare like all the people on this uh, panel has lived this nightmare. They have hundreds, maybe thousands of files that, a, and Dan, a bank manager is going to give those underwriters a checklist, right? Pretty much? It's gonna be something like that, yeah. Yeah, they're gonna give a checklist and they're gonna say, this is, and you need to check box A, B, C, D, E, and F. And if not, and if this is not this, and this is not this, um, then uh, they don't get full forgiveness. So what we need to do, and hopefully Dan will be able to, once we get this guidance, we'll be able to get some ideas from the banking industry, what the rules are and what we have to do to get this maximum forgiveness. But in my example, let's say I write a, a payroll out that goes from April 20th till May 1st and it's paid on May 4th. Well, my doctor says, wait a minute, I had the money on May 4th, it's in the covered period, right? I got my money, that's when the covered period starts. But, it is in, but it's for costs incurred from April 20th to May 1st. Therefore, the underwriter says, and eh, wrong answer, not included, not costs incurred during the uh, covered loan period, and it's not forgivable. So if you choose, folks, to put your people back on payroll, what you want to do is to pay payroll for a period that is in the covered loan period that is incurred. And my last bullet point there is if, start, if you don't start paying payroll, if you're paying employees starting the date you receive the loan and not for a period you receive the money. So I said to this doctor, I said, all right, doc, you got the money on May 4th. Your, your new pay period and your payroll starts May 4th, right? When, when does it end? He says it goes through May uh, 14th and uh, goes through May 13th and we pay it on May 15th. All right, so you're gonna put people back on payroll on May 4th not on April 20th. So let's go to the next slide. We've got some examples here. And again, mind you, we, I, I want to be very, very clear. This is if you choose that you have had this money and you are bringing your employees back full time now, this is, this is how, and you're going to do a payroll before the guidance from the SBA is issued. We are not recommending anything on this. This is if you make that choice, you want to get everybody back in the office, start paying them full time, get them off of unemployment. Okay. Here's the example that we believe is going to work. And stop me, guys, if, if, if you think I, I, um, I might be off base. I, I think I got this. So the PPP loan goes into Dr. Wiederman's account today, May 5th. I furloughed, laid off my dental team on March 16th. And I want to bring them back to work upon receipt of this money. I pay twice a month. My next payroll goes from April 29th to May 13th. Because remember, there's always a timing difference, Scott, right? When we pay a payroll, we pay them until a couple of days before. So on May 13th, we call the payroll service and we call the payroll in, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. So we're going to pay. So on, on May 13th, I get a call from Heartland ADP, Paychecks, whoever your payroll service is. And we call in a full payroll based on exactly what uh, a full payroll would have been had there not been a pandemic and we're using the PPP money. So here's the example. My gross payroll for the period of May 5th to May 13th, and you figure that out, even though your pay period would have gone from May 1st, we don't want to pay from May 1st because that's not in the covered period. We pay from May 5th is $9,400. My federal employer payroll taxes are $500 out of the employer's pocket. And my state employer payroll taxes is $100. So the total of the payroll service is going to pull from the account is $10,000. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. And again, folks, this is what I perceive is going to work. We don't have guidance, but this seems like it should work if you, wanna, if you don't want to wait till the guidance comes out. The money's been deposited into a separate account. So on May 13th, you call in your payroll. $10,000 is going to be pulled from your bank account on um, uh, May 13th, is going to be pulled on May 15th. And again, everybody's payroll is a little bit different, but this is, this is a way that you could try and do this. You're then going to go ahead and transfer from your separate PPP holding account, $9,400 in gross salary, 
plus the $100 for the state tax for $9,500. So you're gonna have them pull the payroll from your main account. If you, again, this is if you choose to pay payroll and you choose to put everybody back on payroll before we have guidance. If you're not gonna do that, you don't have to listen to this, okay? The $500 of federal employer tax is not forgivable use of PPP funds. So we want to have an audit trail that we have this money in a separate account. $9,500 goes to my general operating account to pay for $9,500 out of $10,000. $500 is on you. And now when I go for forgiveness, I show the bank, here's, here's a transfer of $9,500 from my PPP funds for forgivable expenses. This is how we think it might work. I might come back to you next week or the week after and say, guys, remember what I told you? Forget it. But for those of you, I've gotten questions. Art, I've got this money one week, two weeks. Scott, I'm guessing you've gotten questions. you got dentists who want to start paying their employees, right? Yeah, yeah. I have, I have dentists who, I, this is their third week, and, and they're looking at the beginning of June of utilizing the rest of the funds. And so there's some real concern out there. We, we have, and, the, and I, I honestly, guys, I debated in my mind whether to come up with a mathematical example and to give advice on this or to just say, guys, we don't know, you're on your own. But I, I truly believe that if you do something like this, if you put everybody on payroll and you pay them their full wages from the date you get this money, I've got to assume you've got the best opportunity of getting this money forgiven at the end of the eight-week period. I, I, Megan, I don't know what else to tell people, really. I mean, this you're, is- You're exactly right. That is the intent of CARES. That is the intent of the law. So again, until we see guidance, we won't know for sure, but it's, it's the best advice we can give right now. That's right. And I felt, I, I, I didn't want to get on here and, and have all, you, all of you, we got a lot of people on this call just say, oh, this is a waste of time. So this is if you're going to do this. Um, don't pay payroll for any period prior to the date the money is deposited in your account. Because I guess, I'm guessing, Dan, when the underwriters are looking, they're going to look at the period of the payroll. And if it's not incurred during the, the covered period, they will maybe say disallowed for forgiveness. You, you, you may not know. And again, we don't have guidance, but if you're going to pay the payroll before the guidance comes out, we believe this, this conforms to the CARES Act. And, and obviously, since this is a client webinar for I Bailey and, and, and HMWC, uh, call Scott, call me. Uh, in, in our, uh, for our HMWC folks, uh, you can talk to Pam and Don and Sam and we'll, 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 we'll walk you through and hold your hand on all this stuff. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about rent and utilities. This gets more fun. Um, Megan, get, the, get your torch out to start lighting your hair on fire. Get ready, let's go. We're ready to go, let's do it right now. Okay, so basically, since the covered period is eight weeks, the amount of rent utility you're gonna be forgiven is not two months. It's 850 seconds of a year's worth of rent. So I've done the math for you. See the calculators right up there, folks. And basically what we're looking at is it's 92.31% of your monthly rent is what you will be if they go by what's in the CARES Act. So for example, if your rent's 5,000 a month, here's how the math works for the month of May. The forgivable amount of your rent is 5,000 times 12 is 60,000 per year, divided by 52 weeks times eight weeks is $9,230.76. So your rent for two months is 10,000. The forgivable part is 92.31. That's 92.31% of the rent. And this works for all rent amounts. So let's go to the next page. Next slide, please. So if you have to pay your rent before the guidance is provided, you pay your 5,000 in rent from your operating account and hopefully we'll have the guidance and you would reimburse from your PPP account $4,630.38 and that would be what's forgivable when you submit to the bank. Now, Scott, I had an interesting, several clients called me up and said, I've talked to my landlord and they've said that they'll put my rent off for three months. Well, that might be a problem because if you don't pay your rent and you get this PPP money and your landlord has said, you don't have to pay me rent till September, you're not gonna be able to use this money for forgiveness. 
So again, you might want to, if you're holding on, you might want to, you know, for the rent, you might want to, I don't want to tell you not to pay your rent, but that is a conundrum. But if you're going to pay your rent before we have the guidance, this is what I, this is what the CARES Act says. It's 850 seconds of the rent. It's not two months. Let's go to the next slide, please. What if you decide you want to, now this is the big question. What if you're going to bring back your employees slower than all at once? You're going to come in, you can't get the PPP equipment, you can't, the patients aren't coming in as quickly uh, before you were closed or you wait till your office opens. The next slide says, please don't shoot the messenger. I mean, because some of you are, too, Scott, two, three, maybe even four weeks into getting this money, right? Yeah, yeah, with outstanding questions. A lot yeah. of them. Simply put, Without this guidance, I cannot tell you whether you have violated the conditions of your PPP loan. If I say to all of you on this call, oh, just go ahead, don't worry about it, just spend the money when you want to, when you, when you open your dental office, absolutely not. That is not the message that we are giving today. The message is follow the law. Now, I might come back to you next week and say, oh, SBA said that you can do this. Um, I, I would imagine, Megan, that the SBA guidance is going to be in conjunction with the CARES Act. And if they want to change the CARES Act, then they need to change the CARES Act. But right now, it says pay your employees for eight weeks. All right, here's a question. So I've gotten this at least 15 times. Scott, you've probably gotten it too. So here's the deal. Uh, hey, Art, what I want to do is I want to keep everybody on unemployment for seven weeks and six days. And then we'll take them off of unemployment and then we'll give them eight weeks of payroll on the 56th day. How's that gonna work out, guys? What do you think? And yeah. Yeah, I don't really think that that's gonna be allowable, but again, the law isn't clear um, uh -huh. about whether or not that's not allowable. Right, but we cannot tell you to do that right now because we don't have guidance. So right now we have to go with what the CARES Act says. If you choose to hold on to this money, bring people back and pay them as you start opening up, that is your choice, but that is not what the, what the government wants you to do with this money. Without the guidance, we can't tell you how it's going to affect. It is definitely going to affect the forgiveness because if you don't pay it back, you don't pay it back. Uh, you know, if you don't use it for the intended purposes, it may not be forgiven. So that is our message to all of you today. I know it may not be what you want to hear, but it is what the law says, and they are making these funds available. And, and, and by the way, folks, they did know. They actually, if I remember, Megan, I, I read stuff that they had actually talked in Congress about this, that, well, you know, we've got people making more money on unemployment than, than, uh, than not working, and is that gonna be a problem? And basically Congress's attitude was, uh, we, we get it, but it's not a big deal. It, it, I don't know if you heard that, but I heard that. Well, I mean, it, I, yes, but also they always are, you know, very apt to remind everybody that this extra $600 runs out July 31st. So it's right. not forever. So um, your employees can say that, and they don't want to come back because they're making extra money. But after July 31st, they might not have a job to come back to if somebody else was willing to come and work in your office. And, and that's another thing. And we'll talk about this next week with Ali Ramshian is if you have employees who come and say, well, I'm just not coming back. Uh, I hate to say this. There have been 30 million people who have filed for unemployment in this country in the last four or five weeks. Uh, there are lots of people looking for jobs. And that is not something we want to say. That is not something we're encouraging you to do. But if you're worried that I can't find anybody, there are people looking for work. All right, let's go to the next slide. If you don't use the money for the payroll costs, it's unclear whether you're allowed to use this money after the eight week period as working capital. We're hoping that's what you're allowed to do, but there's nothing in anything that we've read, Megan, Scott, that says you're absolutely allowed to do that. They may come back in the guidance that says, hey, if you don't use this money after eight weeks, you need to pay it back. Because remember, this government's gone making $3 trillion into debt. Uh, they would like to keep it to a minimum if they can. So we'll see. 
And I want to remind all of you that any amount that is not forgiven by the bank will turn into a, a loan over two years at 1% with no payments for six months. So think about it this way. If you get $200,000 in a PPP loan and you decide, guys, I'm, I'm keeping everybody on unemployment. My dental office isn't opening till the end of June. And I'm just going to keep this money through the eight weeks and I'm going to use it for working capital. Well, what's 200,000 divided by 24 months, Scott? That's a big monthly payment starting a year from now. So it's something we need to, to consider. And you can choose to do nothing with the money. That's another choice you have until SBA gives us guidance. Can they penalize us for not following the rules? If we don't know what the rules are, we don't know. It is very frustrating, folks. We're, we're giving you our best and most updated information that we possibly can. We just don't know. I guarantee you, uh, I do my weekly podcast. It, it's recorded on Sundays. We, we, it'll air tomorrow. Um, we're talking about these options. One of the things we talked about in our podcast uh, with, I had three dental CPAs on the podcast is, is that, you know, maybe you use this money as working capital. And I, I kind of played devil's advocate. I said, well, we would like to think that you can, but we don't know. So we don't know. So that's it. Let's go to the next slide. All right. They did give us one tidbit here and I want to move this along so I can get to Randy. So on Sunday, May 3rd, so your government is working overtime. Um, will a borrower's PPP, PPP loan forgiveness, this is frequently asked question number 40 issued Sunday, May 3rd. I cut and pasted it right from the document. Will a borrower's PPP loan forgiveness amount be reduced if the borrower laid off an employee, offered to rehire the same employee, but the employee declined the offer well, that's going to happen. You're going to have people who are going to basically say, you laid me off. You say, I'm going to come back. I get this PPP money. They want to be rehired. And the employee says, no, either I want to stay on unemployment. I'm going to find another job. I'm not coming back. So the answer is no, you're not going to be penalized. But this is interesting. And I had this conversation with, again, our guest for next week, Ali Aramshian, just before I went on this, on this webinar. The, and if I skip down to the bottom, the interim file rule will specify, it will specify that to qualify for this exception, because remember, we have the same number of employees on around June 30th, or when, or when the eight week period runs out, as we had, and we have two choices of which periods to pick. But let's just say, just for simplicity, same number of employees on June 30th as we had on the 15th of February. All right, so in, in that case, if you have two employees who basically call you up and say, I'm not, I'm not working, I'm not coming back. What this says, the interim final rule will sp specify that to qualify for this exception, the borrower must have made a good faith written offer of rehire. Writ so in order to care for this, a written offer of rehire, you have to make a written offer to them to come back to work. Ali will talk about that next week. Talk to your labor attorney. And the employee's rejection of that offer must be documented. That employee, you might say to that employee, write me a letter. No, I'm not writing you a letter. I'm done with you. Well, then just document it in writing on a memo and put it in your file. Employees and employers um, should be aware that employees who reject offers of reemployment may forfeit eligibility for continued unemployment compensation. Megan and Scott, this is the only forgiveness guidance that we have. This is it. This is what the government's given us. Next slide, please. All right, here's one thing I just wanna say. Consult a qualified labor attorney. I have been telling my clients, I get, I, I, I am, I, I'm gonna put an Esquire behind my name, guys. I'm getting so many legal questions, it's not even funny. Megan's gonna do the same, Dan's gonna do the same. Randy, you've already got that, right? You're already a lawyer, right? You're, you need to unmute yourself, Randy, so anyway. Hopefully we can get you uh, on uh, on voice. We can't hear you. Um, hopefully, but anyway. hopefully you can hear me now. Okay. So I'm talking attorney stuff, which is going to come. We're going to talk to you in here in a minute. Um, you need to be prepared to answer. And I know, Randy, you're not a labor law attorney, but you're an attorney. Okay. These people need to be prepared for any questions that employees are going to have before they're asked about being rehired. Because the discussion of, I want to stay on unemployment. And again, Randy, we're not, but, but again, 
you know, being ready is important in any kind of a legal situation, right? Very true. Yep, very true. So I would call a labor law attorney before you have conversations with your employees and say, these are the questions I'm getting or I think I'm going to get. How do I answer them? And Ali will be on next week. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Now, Scott, I'm going to turn this over to you. Our right. government has done it again. <laughs> In so, great fashion at the end of the last week. Go yeah. for it. Then we'll get to Randy. All right. So I'll keep it quick, Randy. So on, uh, I think it was either Thursday or Friday, um, the IRS came out with a notice, as Arts mentioned, 2020-32, um, interpreting or making up their own uh, authority here, uh, saying that any funds that you use under the PPP loan regime that are subsequently forgiven uh, will uh, result in lost deductions for uh, that forgiveness. And so uh, they came out with a law saying that any cancellation of debt, i.e. this forgiven uh, loan proceeds would not be considered taxable income in the CARES Act. Um, this additional guidance that came out last week is essentially contrary to that um, that guidance that came out with the law. And so we're expecting a big pushback from our, uh, our, our group, the AICPA, and also the ADA, I think is pushing back on this as well um, to really uh, tell Congress, this isn't the intent of the law. Uh, employers need to have those deductions for payroll. And this example down below kind of illustrates what the notice uh, was, was intending. And that is, a, say the dental office secures that $100,000 PPP loan, uses the full $100,000 on covered uh, payroll expenses that are eligible uh, for the period, um, and then receives an, uh, the, the full forgiveness of $100,000 at the end of the period. Well, all those payroll costs are non-deductible up to that $100,000 uh, forgiveness. So really contrary to what the CARES Act was intending. So we suspect this will most likely change uh, hopefully <laughs> soon and we'll get additional guidance there, but stay tuned on that. But this is what the IRS uh, just released last week. Now, Ma Megan, you had some comments about that, uh, what Congress is thinking about this law? Yeah, um, let's just say that the congressional members who are the tax writers are very upset about IRS's interpretation and do not agree with them and are pushing back hard. So this is one of those rare instances where you're seeing bicameral and bipartisan support for this to be one of the priority issues in the next um, piece of legislation if IRS just, just doesn't feel the pressure and reverse it themselves, which they can also do. So it could be it could be the CARES Act 2.0 legislates it. Right. Or, or IRS could get it together and reverse this themselves without having to have Congress come in. Because as Scott said, although you can interpret it this way, that was not the intent. And there's a lot of other legal scholars in this space who have said that this is not how IRS should have interpreted it. So they have standing to be able to reverse it on just that alone. Fantastic. All right, guys, any, any other comments on PPP or IDLE or HBO or anything like that, ESPN? Um, you know, the Michael Jordan uh, documentary that's on, which is the only sports there is right now. Uh, although Scott, they did start baseball in Korea that was on TV yesterday. I saw there's a lot about bat flips these days. Yeah, that, and, then, and they had like, like, like paper mache people in the stands. It was pretty funny. So anyway, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Okay, so I'm going to turn this, uh, we're going to turn this conversation in a little bit of a different direction. And everybody, this is really important. I want to introduce my good friend, Randy Curry. Uh, Randy was introduced to me by uh, another uh, dental attorney in our area probably four or five years ago, and I wish I'd have known him 30 years ago. Uh, Randy spends his life, and I'm going to let him tell, tell you a little bit about his background, um, uh, looking at insurance policies and fighting with insurance companies. So Randy, um, Randy's a, a, an attorney in his own law firm in Newport Beach, California. And Randy, welcome to... Um, our uh, I Bailey HMWC webcast. Thank you for coming on today. My pleasure, Art. Nice to see you and uh, welcome to uh, everyone um, in regards to uh, this very, very important topic. Okay, Randy, give it just a minute, a little bit about your background and what you've done in your uh, professional legal career. 
Sure. I have been practicing law for a little over 30 years, and uh, basically my expertise, everything I've ever done is to represent the interests of consumers, insurance consumers, in either claims activities or, or litigation against the insurance uh, industry in the state of California. Okay. And, and you've actually worked with some of my clients that are not in the state of California. Um, yeah. So you work with people pretty much all over the place, right? Yes, I have helped a lot of people out of state in regards to consultations, in regards to insurance and insurance claims. Okay. So you and I started talking early in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic about business interruption insurance. So let's start the conversation, Randy. Talk to our dentists. They, they all probably have a, a general liability policy or other types of policies. Where would you find a business interruption policy or provision, where, what would they have? What would they have bought? Most likely all of uh, your viewers and listeners have such a policy. It's generally not called um, a business interruption policy. It's not a freestanding policy that says business interruption for the most part. They are usually found within, the coverage is usually found in within a business or commercial policy that covers for fire theft, um, and those types of losses, um, liability losses as well. But the uh, insurance uh, is generally found in categories. It's different based on the policy and it's different based on the um, insurer, but it's generally found as loss of income or loss of use coverage, or um, what's really important in regards to the COVID-19 matter is what's called civil authority coverage or government authority coverage. Now, I know you and I have talked about this, is that um, uh, after, I think, I think you told me it was after, maybe after the SARS uh, pandemic, uh, that insurance policies started changing a little bit or was it something else? It was, it was definitely after the SARS um, problem and after 9-11 that the insurance companies started um, imposing uh, exclusionary language in regards to business, what we, what we generally category as business interruption coverage. And a lot, of the, a lot of the policies now have specific exclusions in regards to virus, um, which are, uh, in, are problematic, but they're not the kiss of death um, for coverage under these policies. We're, we're gonna get into that discussion. Are there actually, uh, business interruption provisions and policies that, that, that really don't, don't say anything about this? Are they all over the board? How does that work? Uh, they're all over the board. Generally, there's coverage for loss of use or loss of income. And uh, when dentists buy these policies, uh, it's probably something that uh, smart consumers like all of us probably know the least about and generally throw the policies in drawers after we've purchased them. Uh, these policies are generally anywhere from 50 to 200 pages long. So I can't say that probably anybody reads the entire policies. You think, my gosh, I, I trust my broker. I trust my insurance company. I buy this. I'm paying pr big premiums on it. Uh, there should be coverage for any uh, loss uh, of the type that uh, we're experiencing today. So I have done, Randy, you and I have done multiple cases together. So Randy, you'll call me up and you'll say, Art, uh, I have a client who is disabled, all right? Uh, I'm, I, a client is disabled, that their arm is hurt and this and that, and they wanna file a business overhead uh, claim, or they wanna file a claim for uh, what's called residual disability, which is disability if you are, you know, total disability is easy. If you're disabled, the doctor says it, everybody agrees you're disabled. I know it's not that easy, but residual disability, you come to me and you say, Art, I need you to calculate how much their lost revenues have been, but then you have to read the policy. And, and Randy, how many times have I said to you, how do you do this for a living? How many times have I said that to you? Almost every time. Okay, because you read these policies and, 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 and for my panel, if you guys have trouble sleeping, I will send you a couple of these policies. It'll, it, it's better than NyQuil. It really is. It's like so good. And it's amazing how ambiguous they are. But the one thing that Randy taught me in an insurance policy, this is one of the first things he taught me, folks, is that 
ambiguity in a legal contract, in an insurance contract, it goes in the favor of who, Randy? Goes in favor of the consumer, in favor of the insured. Okay. So what that means is, and I have gotten, and Scott, maybe you've gotten some people who have, who have called you up and said, oh, I called my insurance company and they said it's not covered. So I have a doctor. Um, and and well, well, let, me, let me say that for a minute. Let's go back. There's some litigation going on right now, isn't there? There's a lot of litigation going on already, primarily um, restaurants that uh, are bringing actions against their insurance companies and actually attorneys as well, law firms that are bringing actions against their, their insurance companies for business interruption claims that have been denied. And, 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 and so what is the, you mean for the COVID-19? Yes. Okay. And, and what is, what, okay, so you're the, you're the lawyer for the, um, uh, for, the, for the restaurant. And it says in there that viruses aren't covered. What is the argument of the plaintiffs in the case? Is the, uh, re is the restaurant really closed because of, the, of a virus epidemic that has placed germs within the restaurant? Or are they closed down because a governmental authority or a civil authority says you can't have your restaurant open because of the potential of a uh, virus? Right. That's I mean, the issue. So there is coverage for loss of use or loss of income in a lot of these policies. And the question then becomes, uh, if the virus exclusion therefore does not apply because the virus isn't on the property, um, does the insured have a direct, what they call a direct physical loss to their property, which is common language in those policies. They're very difficult to try to figure out, but direct physical loss has been um, litigated um, before in many different instances. And uh, if you can't show that you have a direct physical loss because you don't have a fire or a flood, or a hurricane that comes through your dental office, well, you sure can say I'm, sh I'm shut down because the, the um, civil authority, the government or the, or the um, uh, association, the dental association has told me I need to close down and bar the doors. I can't let people in except for potential emergency situations. Is that a direct physical loss? I think it is because there, those, the, the term direct physical loss is not defined in the policies, and what more direct physical loss could there be than being, in a, being placed in, in a situation where you can't use your building for its intended purpose? Well, makes sense to me. I mean, uh, and, and so where are these cases in the courts? Have, there, have, have any of them been decided? No, they're very early on in regards to COVID because uh, the courtrooms are basically closed down except for emergency situations as well. These are considered civil litigation, so they're very, very early on. Well, and, and I have to imagine, Randy, because think about it this way. There are really three groups of, of, of businesses, if you will, if you want to call it that, who have deep pockets. The federal government is one, the banks are two, and the insurance companies are three. And everybody's looking at this, and we know that our dentists on this call and all across the country and the 163,000 members of the American Dental Association have been damaged by having to shut their offices down, uh, some worse than others, and we'll have to see and pray that it's not as bad. But, you know, we're looking at, at, at options. I've got to imagine the insurance industry is petrified over this. They are. Um, I think all of, um, all dentists should file a claim um, whether they are told that there's an, a direct exclusion or not. It's very important that they talk to somebody that knows what they're, what they're doing and understands uh, coverage um, uh, like this, because if, uh, if uh, one of, uh, one of the, your dentist uh, clients were to call the insurance company, they're all going to say, hey, there's no coverage for coronavirus. Uh, is this based on coronavirus? Most of, most of uh, the uh, viewers would say, yes, it's based on coronavirus. Well, no, it's based on the civil um, authority, the government saying to shut down. I don't have coronavirus in my office that I know of. That's right. most cases. So right. everyone should place the claim. Okay, so let's talk about it. Let's say somebody is listening. You know, we have, uh, we have a lot of people on this call. Someone is listening and um, they... They want to file a claim. 
what what, it, what is in, I mean, obviously should should and again, this is in no way, shape, or form an advertisement for you. I don't need to advertise for you. You you sold me the first day we talked, and the fact of the matter is is they send you their policy and you look at it. What's the steps if they want to file a claim? The steps in filing the claim or somebody needs to take a look at the policy, whether it be the insured or somebody on behalf of the insured that hopefully can read the, read the policy and understand it to know what the uh, exclusionary language is and to know what the coverage language is. Most of them I, that I've looked at, in fact, all of them that I've looked at have important coverage language and they have exclusions as well. What, we, what the insured needs to do is try to avoid the exclusionary language and not basically say my, my loss is based on a uh, virus um, and uh, there's a specific virus exclusion. So the policy needs to be reviewed. Then the either, uh, some insurance companies require that the claim be made to the broker, the agent that sold the coverage. Um, some will take the claims uh, at the home office. Um, so the claim needs to be made. Uh, my recommendation is you just put a claim in writing. I am shut down. I was required to shut down. Um, I want claim forms. I want to know how to make a claim. I am making a claim. It's important because all of the policies have limitations on how long you can wait before you make a claim. Some are short, as short as 30 days. Some are 90 days. Some just as re a reasonable amount of time. So March 16th is pretty much the date that we all agree that this pretty much started. Some offices were open a little longer than that. So we're now about 45 days into this. And so, so let's go through the steps. So Randy, you review the policy. You say, uh, you either say, no, this is not a good candidate or yes, we should file a claim. You file a claim. 100% of the time, it's probably gonna be denied, right? Not necessarily 100% of the time. Some of the insurance policies uh, do provide enough coverage where uh, and our, my goal in helping my clients is to make it difficult for the insurance company to just send a form letter denying the claim because that's what's being sent out in a lot of them. I've had clients come in and say, okay, I made the claim and they sent me this denial letter. I look at the denial letter. I've seen five of them that are ex the same exact verbiage. So I know some lawyer has written it for the insurance company. Now but, you also, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, the claim needs to be submitted um, as quickly as possible because then it puts the um, insured in a position. Uh, to, in California, the insurance bad faith statute of limitations is two years. Um, for breach of contract, it's four years. So it puts my clients in California and probably at the same in most states in a better position because they filed a timely claim. They have the opportunity later on, if necessary, to file a lawsuit or if they wish to. They can also make a regulatory complaint complaint to the Department of Insurance in their in their state, like we have in the state of California. And I think very importantly, the legislatures are changing the laws retroactively. As you indicated, you know, everyone's looking for deep pockets, so is the government. I think they are the state governments, the legislatures are introducing legislation to basically disallow retroactively the virus exclusions in many states. And so, we don't know what's going to happen with that. Okay, so 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 someone files a claim on May 10th, and uh, the government, uh, the state of California, the California legislature signed by Governor Newsom says, okay, um, for any claim that was filed before December 28th when they passed the law, is going to be allowed, right? I mean, that's that could happen, right? It could very likely happen, and then if then if the insured has filed a timely claim, the, uh, he's uh, the the insured is going to be in that group of people that may receive some reimbursements because of the government's activity in changing the law. And but what I don't think will happen is um, because the law, the insurance lobbies are so strong, I think um, they're not going to basically want Pandora's box open where anyone who has not even submitted a timely claim for business interruption can all of a sudden say, oh my gosh, the law has been changed. Now I want to file a claim. Um, I think there will be limitations on that. That's why I really, really um, believe that, uh, that insured should, should file claims, even if it looks like they might be denied, because it basically puts them in a position that might, might uh, uh, be gainful later on down the road. We could be talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost revenues and profit. 
you guys are the the experts in putting the claims together. It doesn't necessarily yeah. need, need to be ha need to happen with the claim, but you know those loss of income claims could be absolutely huge for a lot of dentists. So let let's go back, Randy. So they file the claim. The insurance company, in most instances, we believe, will deny it. What's the what's the next step for the insured? They can either file um, a lawsuit against the insurance company for for um, failure to pay the claim. Um, or they can wait in order to file the lawsuit based on the statute of limitations um, where they might be. Um, they can file a regulatory action and say, hey, Department of Insurance, I had expectations of coverage. I asked for the best policy and I paid premiums for what I thought was the best policy. Then something like this happens and my gosh, never expected this to happen, but I thought I would be insured and I'm not. You know, do something about it. Um, and, and then they can also wait and see what happens with the, um, with the change in the law um, uh, and what the um, legislatures do in regards to the um, exclusionary language for virus. Basically puts them in a position where they have time to do something, but if they don't file a timely claim, they may lose it. The insurance company could take the position you didn't file a timely claim on that basis, we're denying it. So it, it's not that big of a deal to file a claim, right? I mean, the language, but what they don't want to do is they don't want to file the claim form by themselves and say, my claim is because of COVID-19. That's not why we're, if they file that, they're probably dead in the water, right? That's my concern. And uh, I've seen s several of them so far that have done that. And they get, like I say, a it looks like a, a form denial letter, even though an insurance company has a duty to investigate the claim. But if you basically admit to a um, exclusion in your policy, uh, the insurance company is likely going to deny it. So, so Randy, let's talk about, you and I have had lots of conversations about business owners getting on the phone with insurance companies. And, and, and this was an example we had. So insurance company on disability starts talking to the doctor and says, oh, doc, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're hurting and all this stuff and we'll help you all we can. So tell us about your hobbies. Oh man, I play tennis, I go golfing, I water ski. Uh, and, and then they're making these notes. And then sometimes these insurance companies are looking at stuff, right? Not only are they making notes, um, a lot of times they're recording those conversations and a lot of times they'll send, uh, they'll send uh, surveillance to see what the, what the dentist is doing. Um, uh, in regards to, you know, physicals and social activities. And uh, as, as we age, um, I know that uh, our bodies don't work quite as well. Um, and uh, the insurance companies, once you place a claim of any kind, oftentimes they think, hey, what is this guy trying to pull? And they think that this, this dentist is old, he just wants to retire, he's not disabled. Um, so, you know, it's a whole different... Uh, mentality by the insurance company when you've submitted a claim as opposed to when you're paying the premiums. So, so the best thing if one of our, one of our listeners on this webinar wanted to file a claim would be to have them send you the policy, you'll take a look at it, um, and then you will advise them. Um, I mean, do you fill out the claim forms? Do they fill out the claim forms? How does that work? Uh, generally, I help the insured um, in regards to a claim when I'm involved, and uh, and I the the, the, cl the claimant or the insured submits the claims the claim themselves. Okay. okay. Uh, based on my you know based on my experience and based upon my guidelines and based on the uh, the manner in which I think they should best present the claim for payment, and uh, uh, that's that's what I like to do. Now, understand, Randy, we, we need to make sure everybody understands this is not a guarantee. This is not a slam dunk. This is not something that everybody should absolutely depend on that they're going to get a huge windfall from an insurance company. This is an action that we're recommending based on interpretation of a policy in the law. Very right? true. I can make no guarantees of coverage. I can make no guarantees that the claim is going to be paid. All I can do is, um, based on my expertise, try to um, have an insured put the claim in its best light in order to make it difficult for the insurance company to deny. Okay. Uh, did we cover most of it, or is there anything else you wanted to mention about these policies and filing the claims? Amy, could you put up the phone numbers for everybody 
because I want everybody to get access to, to the phone numbers. I think it's the next slide. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Randy's phone number is up there if you want to write it down. He's in Newport Beach. Um, I've already had him talking to several of our clients. Um, so there, there's, the, there's the phone number uh, if you want. Um, and and 949-258-4381 if you want to give him a call. Uh, and Randy's been taking calls from some of our clients and because I've already been putting them in touch and stuff. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Because we've got probably about 10 minutes left. I want to take some of the listeners' questions if we can. Um, people oftentimes say, well, after you do this, Randy, after you help me with this, with this uh, claim process and review the policy, you know, what's going to happen then? Generally, you're going to hear from the insurance company. Um, and uh, interestingly, Art, before I got onto this this morning, um, I got, a ref I got a phone call from a, a client that you had sent to me, a dentist in California. And he said, Randy, they got me on the phone and they, um, you know, I, I was afraid to take the call. So they sent me uh, an email and the email says they had questions for me. Um, number one, they wanted to know what was the date of my loss. This is in regards to the COVID business interruption. What is the date of my loss? Well, what do I say? Well, when were you closed down? You know, when I talked to him, when, when were you closed down? Give them, give them that date um, and send them an email back and say, you'd rather do this in writing as opposed to doing it over the phone because he felt uncomfortable. Um, and they try to get you like we discussed on the phone. Second question, they asked him, uh, what was the reason you closed down? Well, if, you know, again, if somebody says I was closed down for uh, coronavirus, um, then they have some some uh, leverage to try to deny the claim. So um, had him respond that I was closed down because of uh, civil authority, I was required to close down and I had a direct physical loss because I, I, the doors, I was required to bar the doors and not let anybody in. Um, and thirdly, they said, well, what phone number, what's the best phone number for us to reach you and ask questions? I had him respond, well, I would prefer that you put the questions in writing. Um, that way he can co contact um, me and he, and we could discuss it before he responded to the question. So that's what's going to follow. That's what's going to follow. It's not going to be just a, a question of uh, submitting the claim and having the um, insurance company pay or deny. But many times they'll ask these questions. I wel I welcome them because it's more of an investigation. That's what the insurance company is supposed to do. A reasonable a reasonable investigation with an eye towards paying the claim, not denying it. That's the law here in California. There you go. Randy, you're golden as usual. Thank you very much. Randy's number is up there. Uh, we've got about, uh, Amy, I have seven minutes. Let's get to some questions. Um, let's see, I'm trying to scroll through. I don't know if I can scroll through this or not. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, I'm just gonna pick some. Uh, is it correct in, that in the latest guidance now they allow, oh, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Is it is it correct that in the latest guidance now they allow up to 20 days after loan approval when the number is assigned for the borrowers to release the money before it gets canceled? Uh, no, Megan. I don't know. It's it's 10. They have to 10 business. I haven't heard that. 10 business. Days. It's up to 20 now. They extended oh, is it. it. Yeah, yeah. So so if they don't. So for instance, we have a big batch of thousands of applications right now where the deadline's uh, Friday. This Friday. And if we don't get those processed in time, then those numbers will be released. Um, we're on track to do it, but it's going to be up to the last second, really. Okay, so so the bottom line is that's on you, right, Dan? Yeah, okay, so, so you won't be getting much sleep anymore. Okay, that's good. There you go. Uh, if you got the loan and you've paid employees to keep them prior to opening, can we use the original rule on the eight weeks? Um, the, the the rule is um, the rule on this one is is it goes from the date that you got the money. That's the date the covered period starts. That's our understanding, Megan and Scott. So if you if you got the loan and you paid employees to keep them prior to opening, can yeah the eight weeks is long. And this is I, I see the names on this is one of our clients, and I will tell you that as long as you are paying it and it's incurred. The, the, the first date that you pay them is the date you get that money. You should be okay according to the CARES Act. That's what we think. Is PPP taxable? PPP is not taxable. 
not taxable income. The forgiveness of this debt is not taxable. The receipt of this money is not taxable. If I got PPP funding and I have received a visa card from EDD, uh, you would have gotten a visa, uh, let's see, am I okay to use the funds on that visa card? Well, if you got a visa card from EDD, which is the California Employment Development Department, uh, uh, I, I know somebody in Nevada who got a visa card, that is for your unemployment. Am I okay to use the funds on that visa card? Am I supposed to cancel upcoming period? Yeah, now on unemployment, once you start getting paid, you are going to blow up your unemployment insurance. And again, Ali will talk about that next week. But yeah, I mean, you can't be on unemployment and be getting payroll. Now, it may not be all or nothing, uh, but that is something that, yes, you, you, once you start getting a salary, once you start getting money from PPP as a wage, as an employee, you no longer are going to get unemployment. That's, that's the way it, it, it works. I mean, I wish it were different, but it doesn't work that way. Does the 25% have to be used up also? I don't think so. I don't think it does. I mean, if you only spend, most of you, if your rent is 5,000 a month and you got 150,000, you're not gonna come near the 25%. So that does that leave us more money to pay employees? We have to wait for the guidance. We don't know. Will we get partial forgiveness if we only use say 50% for wages? Yes. In the statute, it do, it's not an all or nothing, Megan and Scott, to my understanding. So there will be a calculation that will give you partial forgiveness, and that is in the CARES Act. Can you make one lump rent payment for two to three months, for example, right before the deadline of expenditure for PPP loan, or does it have to be split evenly into a few months? Can you use the funds to pay rent in advance? The rule is incurred and paid, folks. So I suspect that, you know, do, can, we, can we pay three months? I don't know, it's not incurred. We have to wait for the guidance. I don't think I can give them a concrete answer. Uh, I can make stuff up. Should I just start making stuff up, guys? What do you think? You should create your own rules. I think everyone else okay. is. This is the, well, we have, we have, when I go golfing, we have what's called Wiederman Golf Association rules. All scores are quoted approximately. So we're going to have Wiederman PPP rules. What do you think, guys? Is that a good idea? You no, might need not. to talk to, to Randy about your, uh, your insurance after that. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Do retirement plans include plans like profit sharing plans? Yes, they do. Absolutely, they do. Um, uh, if so, how does that work since PSP has to calculate based on year and contribution? That's a great question. So again, incurred and paid. So under incurred and paid, one would think, Scott and Megan, that the retirement plan contribution that will be allowed as part of the PPP reimbursement is going to be the retirement plan contribution for the eight weeks that we have this covered period. Well, the problem is, is that A, most dentists don't know what they're gonna be putting in, and B, the government might have heard that businesses' incomes are gonna be down. So are dentists gonna be making contributions to profit sharing plans for 2020? I suspect not as much as they were in 2019, so we'll have to see what the guidance says. Can you start paying yourself first while closed? Have to wait for the guidance. Don't know. Um, I suspect if you pay yourself and you don't pay your employees, I suspect the government is not going to be terribly happy about that, but we'll see. How about paying 1099 employees? You cannot, 1099 employees are not covered under the PPP payroll costs. Are we pretty clear on that, guys? Cannot do that. Okay. Uh, does PPP forgiveness count the total number of employees or only full-timers? It's full-time equivalents. I barely actually kind of, and I'll make this the last question because we got to wrap up here. Um, I barely had a great webinar on this, not for dentists, but for all of their business owners. And they talked about how the SBA looks in their other programs at 30 weeks, a year, 30 hours a week as a full-time employee for SBA programs. So what they'll probably do is Anybody who works over 30 hours a week will be a, 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 an FTE, and then they'll add up all the, the, the part-timers, divide it by maybe 120 hours is what we're thinking, and you may end up with an additional one or two. Folks, uh, Amy, I think we got to call it a day, right? We do. We have a minute to spare. A minute to spare. Uh, panel, thank you so much. Um, 
Uh, Megan Mortimer from the ADA, you are a godsend. I am so glad that you've been able to help all of us get through this. Um, Scott, great, great work. Congratulations on making partner at I Bailey. That's a huge accomplishment. Randy Curry, thank you so much for all of this, your information. Dan, thanks for helping all the people that you've helped. We'll see you a week from today. Same, Amy, same bad time, same bad channel, right? That's correct. All right. God bless all of you. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Good job, Art. Thank you. Nice to right. you. Take care. Thanks, guys. Take right. care, guys. Thank you, guys. Great to see you. Thanks for all your help. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. We'll see all you right. later.